All right, ladies and gentlemen, you are locked on Falcons. I'm your host, Aaron Freeman, and today we are reviewing the all 22 from the Falcons week nine win over the New Orleans Saints, as well as answering your listener questions. You are locked on Falcons, your daily Atlanta Falcons podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. So guys, you know me, I'm Aaron Freeman, been covering the Falcons for many years, formerly at Falcfans.com, RIP, still going strong on Twitter, at Falcfans, putting up weekly content over at the Falcoholic, the SB Nation website for the Atlanta Falcons, and of course, the host of this world-renowned Locked On Falcons podcast, your daily Atlanta Falcons podcast, right here on the Locked On Podcast Network. Today's Locked On Falcons episode is brought to you by McDonald's, proudly serving communities since 1965. McDonald's has always been more than just a place to get tasty, affordable food. It's also the unofficial community center. So we give a big thank you to our friends at McDonald's for always being there. I'm loving it. So today's episode of Locked on Falcons will be reviewing the All-22 from the Falcons' Week 9 win over the New Orleans Saints. That will include focusing on why the Falcons' run defense improved after a, an abysmal first quarter in terms of stopping the run. And we'll talk about Anthony Rush, the hero that we all need um, and possibly deserve. And then we'll get into the Q&A portion of today's episode and uh, one of the big questions that we'll be answering on today's episode is why the Falcons are tending to let a team like the Saints back into the game and and how that is contributed to the lack of pressure uh, that they could not get on Trevor Simeon and Taysom Hill in a Saints game. And then we'll get into some further questions about the Falcons wide receiver group. We'll talk about Matt Ryan's performance so far in 2021 and how that compares to previous seasons. We'll talk about what some of the team's biggest needs are heading into the offseason now that roughly half of this 2021 season has been played. But before we get into that, we'll talk a little bit about the roster moves that the Falcons made on Tuesday, releasing our beloved Jacob to Odie Mariner. We'll get into what that means for him and his team, as well as some of the other roster moves made on Tuesday. But before we get into all of that, guys, I want to thank you for making Lockdown Falcons your first listen each and every day. And of course, Lockdown Falcons is free and available on a variety of podcast platforms, including Apple, Odyssey, Google, and Spotify, as well as now on YouTube. Make sure you check out the video version of Lockdown Falcons by subscribing to Lockdown Falcons on YouTube. Make sure you leave a comment. Make sure you give us a like. All that jazz. Uh, so let's jump into the roster moves before we get into the All-22 review. The Falcons cut Jacob Tuody Manor, affectionately known as JTM, as well as punter Cam Nizalek on Tuesday. They added cornerback Chris Williamson from the practice squad to the roster to replace JTM's roster spot. And what this move probably most signals is that Dante Fowler is on track to return potentially this week or next week uh, from injured reserve and the knee injury that he was dealing with. We will also assume that Stephen Means is knee injury that caused him to exit the game uh, in New Orleans on upon being tackled on that fumble recovery. He came back into the game later and then exited uh, once more. Probably is not a long term injury. Um, you know this is a tough break for JTM. He's, he's been a guy that we here on Locked on Falcons have been big fans of over the last couple of years, been big supporters of. He's been a player that we've been wanting to see, um, you know, get more playing time. And when I use we, I'm not using the royal we. I mean, I'm meaning myself and probably a lot of the people that listen to this podcast. Uh, you know, that's part of the brand here on Locked on Falcons. And I know it's been a weekly occurrence to complain about JTM's lack of playing time uh, for a lot of folks. It's been a weekly occurrence to complain about Stephen Means' abundance of playing time. And obviously this uh, move doesn't seem to indicate that the Falcons are, you know, based off of JTM's, you know, uh, announcement on social media on Tuesday afternoon after his release, you know, sort of thanking the Falcons for his time here. It doesn't necessarily signal that the, the team immediately plans to reassign him to the practice squad. Uh, so, 
you know, it's a tough break for JTM. Unfortunately, he didn't get the opportunities this season that I think he potentially deserved. And, and unfortunately, we did not get to see more of him after him flashing several times in those first couple of games with a couple of uh, effort sacks there. So we'll just see what the team moves forward. We knew that the edge group was going to be a work in progress. We knew that, you know, JTM of those edge rushers, given the improvement of James Valters, uh, and we'll talk a little bit about him later on today's episode, you know, JTM seems to be the guy that was lost in the shuffle. And particularly with, you know, Adeo Gundeji essentially taking his role on special teams, on punt coverage and, and coverage units, uh, leading to JTM really not getting much of an opportunity either on special teams where he starred last year and was the team's best special teams player and arguably a Pro Bowl caliber special teams player for the team a year ago. And now you couple that with, you know, him being lost in the shuffle on defense. As for the punting position, uh, you know, with Cam Nyslick coming back from injured reserve and being released, uh, this presumably means that Dustin Colquitt will be the Falcons punter moving forward this season. Although we praised Dustin Colquitt on our rapid reaction on Monday's episode, going back and rewatching the film, I'm a little less praising of Dustin Colquitt, just largely due to the fact that on that big return Deontay Harris had late in the game that helped set up a score, I felt like Dustin Colquitt outkicked the coverage there, did not get enough hang time on that, and that led to Harris having a lot of room to operate, which led to that big return that helped uh, lead to a, a, an eventual score for the Saints. So Dustin Colquitt, while coming off one of his better games so far this season in limited action, still, you know, the punting position still remains very much a work in progress if this is the best of what we're going to get from Dustin Colquay. It's better than what we got from Cam Nizelec, but certainly not good punting at, so far this season based off of what we've seen limited from Dustin Colquay. So with that being said, that sort of addresses the Falcons roster moves. We'll get into the All-22 portion, and, you know, that involves answering one listener question from Falcoholic uh, Falcon Nihilist, DW, at Falcoholic DW on Twitter. He asked, curious to hear how Anthony Rush and James Walters did the entire game. So, you know, that was one of the things I wanted to investigate when we watched the All-22 this week to sort of see what was the catalyst for the Falcons' run defense improving after an abysmal first quarter uh, and how they were effective at shutting down that Saints run game after the first quarter. And, you know, I think a lot of it was due to, to players like Anthony Rush and Mike Pinnell providing that much needed beef in the middle. In the first quarter, a lot of the Saints' successful runs came in situations where they were not only able to get movement up front with their offensive line, but those offensive linemen were also able to climb to the second level and take out those Falcons linebackers who we know are not great when it comes to taking on blocks at the point of attack. And that opened up cutback lanes and creases for players like Mark Ingram and Alvin Kamara to find and, and exploit it. Um, then you saw Anthony Rush and Mike Pinnell get a lot more work starting early in that second quarter. Uh, and those guys, I think, did a much better job winning up front. They were better able to handle the double teams than some of the more undersized Falcons defensive linemen earlier in the game. Um, you saw not only once those guys got inserted in the game, but you also saw some of those undersized D linemen looking at you, Grady Jarrett, looking at you, Marlon Davidson in particular. I thought thereafter, uh, whether that was due to uh, them facing more one-on-ones uh, because Pinnell and, and Rush were facing more of those double teams. But I thought Jared and Davidson did a much better job winning their one-on-one -on -one blocks and asserting uh, their dominance, so to speak, uh, and, and getting off blocks to make plays. And, you know, I thought Anthony Rush played really well. I thought he flashed on a number of plays. And I was a little surprised to see how poorly graded he was by Pro Football Focus in this game. And as I often say on, on the podcast, like 80% of the Pro Football Focus's grades I'm I'm good with. But there's that 20% that leave me scratching my head and, and Rush's grade uh, is part of that 20%. So uh, as for James Vauders, I charted him with a sack in a hurry. Obviously, he had this sack on the, on the sack strip that led to the Stephen Means fumble recovery and ultimately led to a Falcon score. Um, pro football focus did not give him credit for that second hurry in the game, but outside of those two positive pass rushes and then a couple of positive run plays where he was doing a good job setting edge, you know, he didn't do a whole lot to write home about, but, you know, certainly was a solid contributor, 
Uh, and, you know, that's probably a factor in why the Falcons felt comfortable moving on from Jacob to Woody Merritt or moving forward, uh, given that they feel like Vauders can provide a little bit more juice there in what their game plans are moving forward. So with that being said, we'll talk a, a little bit more and answer some more listener questions, starting with conversation about the Falcons wide receiver group, as well as what are some of the causes of their more recent late game collapses as we continue today's Locked on Falcons podcast. But I know when you guys are stuck in bumper to bumper traffic or wherever you call home in a, whether that's Atlanta, you wind up burning through a ton of gas and you probably think, you know, you could be saving a lot more money at the pump and you now can with a new app called get upside, get upside is a free app. And when you open an account with them, you get 25 cents back per gallon every time you fill up. And the, over time, that kind of savings can really start to add up when you can make as much as two to $300 a month in terms of, cash back and you can get multiple cash out options. You can get direct payments into your bank account. You can get PayPal. You can get your money put into gift cards for Amazon and other retailers. And when you download the free Get Upside app in the App Store or on Google Play and use our special promo code touchdown, you will get a bonus 25 cents back every time you fill up. So 25 cents up to 50 cents back per gallon. So go download the free Get Upside app right now, available again in the App Store or Google Play. Use that promo code TOUCHDOWN uh, when you sign up. Again, that's Get Upside promo code TOUCHDOWN to start saving every time you fill up. So our next question comes from Jesse Dahl at This Is The Revolt on Twitter. He asks, that throw to Alameda Zacchaeus almost gave me a heart attack. Was he the first option or was that a later read? So I don't know exactly which throw to Alameda Lamedes in case you're referring to. I'm assuming you're referring to the first touchdown, uh, but that seemed like the play was designed to go to Kyle Pitts, uh, who did get open on that play. But because, you know, OZ was right in front of Matt Ryan, I, I think he made what he deemed to be an easier throw, although it was uh, in traffic and he had to sort of fit it into a, a small window. If you're referring to OZ's big play later in the game, he was not the initial read on that play. Again, that, that was, I think, designed to be a comeback to Kyle Pitts on the outside. But with Pitts being bracketed on that particular play and, and, and Zacchaeus breaking open late going up against the Saints quarters coverage, he got open on that play, getting past Marcus Williams uh, for a big play uh, for the Falcons. And that helped set up a score later on. Or if you're referring to the second OZ touchdown uh, after the Stephen Means fumble recovery, that play, I think Matt Ryan's initial read was supposed to go to Lee Smith, but he was well covered. And because it was like a basically a two man route, you know, OZ broke open late on that game, uh, on that play with Matt Ryan facing pressure in his face. And, and, you know, Matt Ryan, you know, delivered a nice ball with pressure in his face to a, a wide open uh, Alameda Zacchaeus. So, so our next question is on a similar vein from Matt Kunamito, Kunamoto at Kunamoto Matt on Twitter. He asks, what's the state of our wide receiver room? Ozzy and Gage seem to step up a bit, but was that more of the Saints secondary stinking? So, um, you know, I think it was definitely more the Falcons wide receiver stepping up than the Saints secondary stinking. I, I didn't think I didn't come away from watching the film thinking that the Saints secondary struggled in this game. Um, but the question is going to be whether this game was more of an outlier performance for the Falcons wide receivers. You know, based off of the first eight games, it was because we've only really seen this wide receiver group play well in like a game and a half this week, past week against the Saints and the second half against the Jets. Um, but you know, the question is going to be, is this going to be an outlier performance for the remaining nine games, or is this a sort of a turning point for this wide receiver group? And we can expect to see more performances like this, where this unit steps up moving forward. Uh, and so, you know, we'll, we'll have to decide if, if the signing of Marvin Hall, uh, was the turning point in the Falcon season, because now all of a sudden these wide receivers are starting to step up because they're looking over their shoulder to see Marvin Hall, you know, sort of, you know staring daggers at them and saying he's going to come for their job. So time will tell. Um, but, you know, because I tend to be more skeptical than most, uh, my assumption is that we probably won't see this type of performance normally each and every week. But, you know, we'll see. Uh, Joe Bear at Joe Bear 74 on Twitter asks, we have a general idea of why they're blowing every single lead that they get. But can you go more in depth about what exactly they're doing that causes this issue? What is something that they can do to alleviate this issue? So I won't focus too much on previous games and previous blown leads. I'll focus primarily on this game, largely due to the fact that I've charted this game and, and haven't really charted some of those other games to really sort of 
say it's it's clearly this or clearly that. But basically in this game, it was the Falcons didn't get any pressure in the second half of this game. Right? They almost got no pressure in the fourth quarter. You know, I charted in the first half, the Falcons got pressure on four out of Trevor Simeon's 11 dropbacks, uh, which is about 36%. And generally speaking, you know, I consider 35% pressure to be an acceptable benchmark. So if you hit 35 or above, that's good pressure. Anything below 35 is I consider to be poor pressure. So 36% is about the norm. All right. In the second half, the Falcons only got pressure on seven out of 33 dropbacks or 21%. So well below the norm. Uh, so when you look at the game overall, when the Falcons did get pressure against the Saints this in this game, the Saints averaged about 3.3 yards per attempt on those plays, had a completion percentage of 40% and had a success rate of 27%. On the 33 plays where the Falcons didn't get pressure, the Saints averaged 7.5 yards per attempt, completed 70% of their passes, and had a success rate of 58%. Um, and it wasn't simply because, oh, the Falcons weren't dialing up pressure, weren't throwing blitzes at the Saints. You know, they didn't do a ton of five-man pressures in this game. Uh, they threw five-man pressures at the Saints five times in this game. They were able to generate pressure on two of those plays. Uh, they did bring a lot more four-man concepts where they would drop one of the edges by and large and, and bring a linebacker, bring a corner, bring a safety uh, to sort of swap with that guy. And that's something that they've regularly done throughout the year when they had decided to dial up blitzes and whatnot. And I counted nine times where they brought a four-man pressure like that, and they were only able to get home and, and create pressure on two of those plays. Um, and this goes back to something that Dean Pease has been talking about as of late, which is you can't just simply just blitz because if you're not getting home, then what's the point? You're only you're only putting your secondary in a more vulnerable situation if you're not getting home in those situations. So um, essentially, the Saints did a much better job in the second half of this game handling the Falcons pressure on um, when you count all those four and five man pressures in the first half. I think the Saints had a success rate of about 25 percent when the Falcons blitzed. And in the second half, it was about 50 percent. So, you know, that's it, it, to me, it boils down to the Falcons not getting home. Um, and when you, you know that when you can't pressure the quarterback and particularly in these games where late in games, quarterbacks and opposing teams can get in this pass heavy mode that they need to do to come back in these games. And if you're not pressuring the quarterback, then he's just going to pick you apart. And it doesn't matter whether it's a backup, a third stringer like Trevor Simeon or a, a Hall of Famer like Tom Brady, that guy's going to pick you apart no matter who it is. Uh, so that's where I think that is. And we'll focus more as we continue today's Locked On Falcons, talking about the future of the Falcons, whether it's Foye Aluakun's market value this upcoming offseason in free agency, whether Jalen Hawkins is a potential building block for the Falcons secondary alongside A.J. Terrell. We'll talk about A.J. Terrell and whether he's as good as advertised. We'll talk about Matt Ryan in his 2021 season so far in comparison to previous seasons that he's had, as well as what will be the team's offseason priorities in the draft and free agents uh, free agency based off of what they have done so far this season. But as we are focused on the Falcons future, maybe you guys should be focused on your future by getting a little bit healthier, especially now with the holidays coming up very shortly. And you can certainly eat healthier without having to sacrifice taste because Built Bar is the best tasting protein bar on the market, provide that candy bar flavor without any of the guilt built bars taste just like a candy bar, but they're healthy. They contain 100% real chocolate, but they're low in sugar, low in calories, high in protein, high in fiber. They come in a variety of flavors, whether you're into the limited time flavors like coconut brownie chunk, paranormal pumpkin, blueberry muffin, or you're into the tried and true favorites like salted caramel cookies and cream, peanut butter brownie, or my personal favorite, coconut almond. So go order yourself some today by heading over to built.com. And when you do, make sure you use the promo code LOCKED15 to get 15% off your first order. That's promo code LOCKED15 for 15% off at built.com. So our next question comes from Don Francisco at F Muno Munoz. I can't say I'm, I'm sorry. I can't, I can't talk or read today. F Munoz 96. Why can't I say that? Anthony Munoz. I can't say that. Munoz. All right. How much is Ola Kuhn going to want if he keeps playing the way he is? 
Pro Football Focus just did an early top 50 2022 free agent rankings, and, and Foye Oluokun was their top-rated off-ball linebacker, ranked at number 44 on that top 50 list, and they projected his contract to be about $8.5 million a year with $20 million guaranteed, and that feels like the lower-end projection for what Oluokun should get on the open market. You've seen a lot of uh, mid-tier free agents make more money in recent off seasons, like 10, 11 million dollars a year, uh, if not more. So when you're asking me what Foyer Oluokun wants, he probably wants that upper end. Uh, you're you're looking at what he wants is Corey Littleton money or Jerome Baker money, which is going to be 12, 12 and a half million dollars a year. Whether he'll actually get that is a different conversation, and we'll just sort of have to see at the, at that point later uh, this off season. At uh, Tom Salad to the Salad on Twitter, he has while Terrell seems like a definite long term building block in the secondary, do you see Hawkins as being another building block back there? So when you say building block, I'm assuming you know that implies to me a guy that you can kind of quote unquote set it and forget it with, where you just basically plug him in and you don't have to worry about that position for you know five plus years or whatever the case may be. I don't, I'm not there with Jalen Hawkins. I've been impressed with Jalen Hawkins. He certainly outperformed my initial post draft expectations for him, where I just thought kind of thought he would be at best a competent backup safety and now he's looking like a guy that could potentially be a starter for this team and based off of his limited action this season has been you know an effective part-time player that has an opportunity to grow into more right now i sort of look at him and say i don't think he's quite there yet but he could certainly be a ricardo allen-esque starter for this team moving forward which is a guy that gets the job done but isn't going to necessarily set the world on fire and you know the question is are we going to sit here with Jalen Hawkins and say, oh, like our safety position is is a non-issue moving forward uh, because Jalen Hawkins is, is, you know, solidifying one of those starting spots? Again, that, that to me is, at this point in time is a question mark. Um, but certainly I think going into the offseason, safety is a position that the Falcons could definitely use an upgrade at. Um, and if they have the opportunity to upgrade the position, I think they should by all means, you know, take advantage of that opportunity but should they not and prioritize other positions that we will probably talk about at the end of today's episode some positions that they might prioritize if they don't do that and go into next year with Jalen Hawkins sort of penciled in atop their depth chart at one of those starting safety spots I wouldn't sit here and say that that's the worst possible outcome right so um you know we'll, we'll just sort of have to see how that plays out but it, it could be a situation where Jalen Hawkins gets that opportunity starts the entirety of the 2022 se season at that safety position and based off of how he performs then we'll sit here and say oh Jalen Hawkins either solidified one of those safety spots and could be that Ricardo Allen set it and forget it type starter for the next three to five years or we'd be like oh well maybe Jalen Hawkins wasn't ready for prime time and we do need to prioritize upgrading that safety position in 2023 or something like that um Mac at Mal to villain on Twitter asks, in your opinion, outside of 2016, where were Matt Ryan's best years and how does this year match up so far? Keep up the great work. You're the greatest podcaster alive. Appreciate it. Mac, um, you know, I, I think when it comes to Matt Ryan's best years, you know, you, you look at that three-year block between 2016, 2017, and 2018, where I think Matt Ryan was playing his best football of his career, right? Other years, 08, 2010, 2012 would probably stand out in terms of other good years where he was playing at a high level 2011 will also be up there as well i think when you look at this season so far you've seen four really good games from matt ryan and you've seen four pretty meh games from matt ryan and when you sort of look at that statistically it kind of balances out to matt ryan's kind of having a fairly average season compared to what he has historically done and so it's hard to compare because we're only halfway through this season and when you look at particularly some of Matt Ryan's best seasons, particularly 2012, 2018, you know, he was very good for like the first seven or eight games of that season. So we had a, a fully a, you know, seven or eight really good games in the season. And so far, he only has four this year. So we got nine more games for Matt Ryan. And if it continues on this similar trajectory and, you know, it could be where then of these remaining nine games, like six or seven of them are really good games and only maybe two or three of them are these quote unquote meh performances and if that is the case then you will probably see matt ryan wind up finishing statistically this season with one of the, you know, probably one of his three best seasons probably not quite as good as 2016 
not as good as 2018, but this season potentially is on track to be his third most productive year when you look at certain metrics like adjusted net yards per attempt. Um, and, you know, that's kind of what our expectations, or at least my expectations were going into the season, that basically if Arthur Smith was, you know, worth his salt and if the Falcons had been justified in, in keeping Matt Ryan rather than, you know, moving on from him uh, by selecting a quarterback at the top of this year's draft, the expectation is that Matt Ryan should have one of the better seasons he's had uh, and potentially better than some of the other seasons he's had outside of that 2016 and 2018 season, where which were statistically his most productive ones. Um, so, you know, the issue is going to be that six of the remaining nine opponents come against defenses that currently, according to Football Outsiders, rank in the top 10 defensively in terms of DBO rankings. That's Buffalo, that's New Orleans, that's New England, that's Carolina, that's Dallas and Tampa Bay. And, you know, New Orleans having a top 10 defense, we saw Matt Ryan play really well this past week against them. But his other two performances against top 10 defenses, Tampa Bay and Carolina, were not great performances from him. And so if you basically look at that and say, OK, you know, he only plays well against, you know, 33 percent of the top 10 defenses he faced, that means out of these six opponents coming up, he'll only have two of those games would be good ones. And instead of having, you know, essentially what that will probably wind up having is instead of Matt Ryan having six or seven really good games the rest of the season, it might be four or five. And if that's the case, then you're probably looking at still probably an above average finish for Matt Ryan, but certainly not something that is going to, you know, stand out historically compared to what we have seen for Matt Ryan for most of his career outside of a handful of those seasons. So Kenny at Kenny Lacey, Kenny, Kenny Lacey at K Lacey 2 asks, what was the issue with the run game, O-line problem, scheme problem, running back problem, or combination of all three? I would say it's mostly offensive line issues. I would, If I was to put a number on it, it probably was like 65, 70% of it is offensive line related. Jacob Wheatley asks, was the touchdown in the corner on A.J. Terrell or was Hawkins responsible for that area? I personally charted that as Hawkins being responsible for that because the Falcons were deploying cover two in that situation, and it seemed like that was supposed to be his responsibility. Um, the Aints aren't good. At Marco Alana on Twitter asks, what did you have for breakfast this morning? Um, and, you know, I supported the sponsor of today's episode uh, in, in McDonald's by, uh, you know, I don't eat breakfast, but my first meal of the day was at McDonald's closer to lunchtime. And if you don't believe me, you know, I have the bag, the proof to show you. Um, so CD3224 on Twitter asks, is Arthur Smith going to be a great head coach or is he just another guy? Well, it's hard to say. It's it's very early in the process and in calling him just another guy seems a little bit harsh. But, you know, I would say based off of what we've seen through eight games, he hasn't necessarily emerged from the pack, so to speak. And, you know, it, it's time's going to tell with Arthur Smith, but recently recent history has told us, has shown us that when it comes to offensive minded coaches, typically they come out, you know, they hit the ground running, right? The vast majority of those guys hit the ground running and the, and the few that don't, usually it's because they don't necessarily have great quarterback. Like when we look at Kyle Shanahan, we look at Doug Peterson uh, that didn't necessarily have a ton of success their first year out of the gates we can attribute that to not having great quarterbacks or in Peterson's case, having a rookie quarterback in Carson Wentz. Obviously that's not the situation here in Atlanta with, with Matt Ryan. So when we look at the Matt LaFleur's and the Kevin Stefanski's and the Andy Reeds, et cetera, these and Sean McVay's, these offensive minded coaches that came out, you know, hot uh, in year one, you know, it doesn't seem like Arthur Smith has quite lived up to that expectation. So for me, because again, I'm a natural skeptic, I don't necessarily assume that he's going to, you know, jump into that group, uh, into that conversation with those guys that we generally consider to be the the home run hires as far as offensive minded coaches. But he could get there. You know, it, it could be just due to the fact that he doesn't have his guys, the Falcon salary cap situation, free agent stuff. So I don't want to sit here and write off Arthur Smith that he could wind up, you know, becoming a very good head coach. But if you're asking me right now, based off what I've seen so far, like I'm not necessarily expecting the Falcons to go to a Super Bowl in the next two to three years uh, with Arthur Smith under the head coach. And again, I don't necessarily know if that's due to Arthur Smith not being good enough to do that, but just the circumstances here in Atlanta, I don't think necessarily are pushing them into that direction. If we're that's what we're using to judge, you know, who's a, a good head coach or not. Uh, CD3224's next question is, is AJ Terrell as good as advertised? It depends on what ads you're looking at. You know, I saw a graphic the other day that basically had Jalen Ramsey and, and A.J. Terrell as PFF's highest graded cornerbacks this year. And to me, it's kind of 
the same argument that we used to have like what a decade ago when it was Richard Sherman versus, you know, Darrell Revis. Um, you know, they're not really asked to do the same things, right? In this case, AJ Terrell is kind of the Richard Sherman in this conversation, and Jalen Ramsey is more the Darrell Revis. Um, I think when you look at what AJ Terrell is asked to do, he has been outstanding in executing what he has been asked to do. But in terms of the things that we typically value out of corners, which is, you know, man coverage skills, you know, shadowing number one wide receivers and all that various things, AJ Terrell has not been asked to do that really at all this season. And when he was asked to do that last year, he really struggled with it. Um, and so like, you know, Jalen Ramsey's more often asked to do those types of things. And, and because again, we tend to value that, um, you know, basically what I'm getting at is if you're going to start having conversations about AJ Terrell being on as good as any other corner in the NFL, I would probably pump the brakes on that somewhat um, because AJ Terrell isn't really asked to do the things that we typically value when we have those conversations about who is the best cornerback in the NFL. Jalen Ramsey would still get my vote as far as that goes. But certainly, as I said, um, if the advertisements you're looking at are basically AJ Terrell being one of the better cornerbacks in the NFL and, and, you know, doing his job as well as you can possibly expect him to do. And again, that job is different from what other cornerbacks jobs are then, you know, AJ Terrell has been as good as advertised. Our last question comes from I am those MFers at Padre 1013 on Twitter. He asks at this point, what positions should the team be targeting next free agent period, next free agency period, and what positions should be prioritized in the 2022 draft? Well, you know, I don't necessarily like answering offseason questions about what the team should do because I feel like a big part of the equation for that is the draft and because I don't really get into the draft until like February, March and don't have a really good handle on, you know, what type of talent is going to be available in the draft until those months. I don't feel comfortable saying what the team should do uh, until that point, but in terms of what the team will or would do, you know, we can make semi educated guesses at this point in the uh, season. Although again, there's still a lot of football left to be played. A lot of questions that still need to be answered about various aspects of this team and we'll see how that sort of moves the needle in certain directions moving forward uh, over the next couple of months but you know i think what's going to be fascinating to watch and anybody who's been listening to this podcast for the last several months has been hearing me talk about you know i'm very invested in finding out what this regime does next offseason because we're going to find out a lot more about this regime than we did in their initial offseason. And I it'll be interesting to sort of contrast this new regime, this current regime under Terry Fontenot and Arthur Smith with the former regime under Thomas Dimitrov and, and the various other Falcons head coaches because the previous regime certainly is believer in a need-based strategy and in, in believer in a narrative-based strategy, which is they will prioritize you know a position or position group or is sort of a mantra and invest heavily in that, that into positions that they feel fulfill that. And in this case, you know, if you apply that to this current team, you would expect, okay, it's going to be a trench heavy off season. It's going to be about getting more physicality on both sides of the line of scrimmage, you know, on offense, that means improving the offensive line. That in, means improving the run game by investing at the running back position, you know, wide receiver is a position that's up in the air because we still have to figure out, you know, what's going on with Calvin Ridley, where he fits into the group and whether or not, as we talked about earlier, this wide receiver group is capable of more new Orleans saints week nine performances moving forward than they have been through the first eight weeks of the season. So if we get more of those types of performances, we could very much see a situation where the team would go into the offseason feeling like adding a second tight end is a bigger priority than adding a wide receiver because that second tight end is going to be much more of an inline player, given that Kyle Pitts is kind of a wide receiver at this point in time. And, and that guy would that second tight end would contribute to beefing up the trenches and whatnot. Um, you know, I think defensively, you, you're expecting a lot of investment in the front seven, uh, you know, beefing up that line of scrimmage. You know, maybe that's in free agency. Maybe that's going out there and getting an edge rusher like Harold Landry. Maybe that's getting a linebacker like Rashawn Evans or Jayon Brown, former Titans that Dean Pease is very familiar with. Uh, you know, those guys would potentially cost money. Uh, but, you know, 
given that the Falcons have potential holes at those positions, particularly edge rusher. I think edge rusher is right now probably the biggest need on the team, going back to the point we made earlier where this team really needs to generate pass rush if they're going to maximize uh, their success moving forward. Um, but, um, you know, I think the D-line is also going to be a priority in beefing up that unit. And, you know, anybody who's been following me on Twitter over the last week knows I've been vocally anti-Jordan Davis, the big nose tackle uh, from Georgia, uh, who's been, you know, projected and mocked to the Falcons several times over the last several months uh, in the middle of the first round. And it's not because I don't think Jordan Davis is a really good football player and or won't be a really good NFL player. It's just, you know, my anti-Jordan Davis-ness is more philosophical and based off of draft history where there just is not a high degree of success drafting those tackles in the first round of the draft. You know, it, it's not as bad as saying drafting a kicker that high, but you know, it's one of those things where like you should kind of put it in that boat. Um, and, and you know, there's a lot of talk of, you know, Jordan Davis being this, you know, stud player. And, you know, I think you, if you draft Jordan Davis in, in round one, particularly early in the round one, uh, you're you're basically betting on him being this outlier player. You're betting on him being this Vita Vea or Don Terry Poe type of nose tackle that is a relative rarity in the NFL of being this three down player. And even technically Vita Vea isn't really a three down player like that. Um, certainly not to the degree that Poe was in Kansas city. Um, and I just don't see Jordan Davis on those guys' level in terms going into the NFL. Maybe he can get there one day, but until he does, you know, that's maybe two, three years down the road in his NFL career. And until he does, you kind of need him to be this kind of snacks Harrison, level black hole in the run defense uh until then in order to justify being selected that high as you develop his pass rushing game and you know snacks harrison is probably the most productive run defender that has played professional football over the last decade right like he was a hollow he was a jj watt level run impact full force in run defense uh comparable to what jj watt was as a pass rusher or what aaron donald is as a pass rusher as far as interior defensive lineman and you know to me that's just a extremely narrow bullseye to hit either jordan davis has to be this vita Vey or don terry poe like exception you know rarity in terms of a three down pass rushing nose tackle or this sort of elite hall of fame caliber run defender in order to justify his draft selection. And as I said, like you're betting on him being an outlier, you're betting on him being this narrow bullseye. And that to me just inherently is a bad bet. Um, and while I think Jordan Davis will be a good pro, I just don't know if he's going to be on that level in order to justify drafting him as high as you want. And not to mention that, you know, traditionally that position, you don't necessarily need to invest high resources in order to get productive play. And we saw that in effect, you know, with Anthony Rush and, and Mike Pinnell being guys off the street that the Falcons were able to add and seemingly based off of what we saw on Sunday, making significant improvements to their run defense without the Falcons having to invest that level of resource. So that's that's the reason why I'm I'm quote unquote anti Jordan Davis. It's not because I don't think he's a good player. It just doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me to invest that type of resources. But that being said, it would not shock me at all if the Falcons decided to draft Jordan Davis because, again, it fits into the, that mantra, that narrative of we want to be more physical and Jordan Davis is the most physical player in this upcoming draft class. And so he fits in line with that narrative. And that to me is what a Thomas Dimitrov would do. And I'm curious to see if that's what a Terry Fontenot would do. And when you look at past drafts where or past off seasons where the Falcons were focusing on physicality, were invested a lot of resources in you know, the trenches on both sides of the ball, 2012, 2014, 2019, it didn't really pay off for the Falcons in those off seasons where they drafted and signed a bunch of guys to beef up, you know, the offensive line, defensive line and whatnot. And one wonders like, you know, maybe the difference between this new regime is something we touched upon a little bit with Jeff Schultz on yesterday's episode is that, you know, they can make similar plans, but they just do a better job executing. And maybe it does pay off if they go in, in terms of that physicality, and instead of drafting, you know, Peter Kahn's, instead of paying Tyson Jackson and Paul Soliai and Jamon Brown and James Carpenter, you you see them, you know, hit on uh, those free agent signings or, or those draft picks, um, you know, with them going more of a physical approach moving forward this upcoming offseason than our previous uh, regimes uh, did. So that's going to be fascinating to watch. The other thing that I think is going to be fascinating to watch is, you know, given the best player available mantra. Um, you know, what does the Falcons prioritize 
various positions because this team has an enormous number of needs. Uh, basically, outside of the kicker and long stepper position, you can make the argument that every position on this roster has room for upgrade. And, you know, that doesn't mean I'm saying like, oh, the Falcons can get a better starting quarterback than Matt Ryan, but they certainly can get a better backup quarterback than Matt Ryan. And certainly you can make an argument that it's worth investing so that we don't have to go through the same thing next summer that we went through this past summer, pulling out our hair, worrying about whether Josh Rosen versus AJ McCarron versus Felipe Franks can be a viable backup quarterback for Matt Ryan uh, moving forward. So again, every position outside of kicker and long snapper is that. And because of that, and their best player available philosophy, even though we look at edge and D-line and O-line and running back as potential positions that sh they should prioritize if the goal is to be more of that needs base and, and you know, upgrading the needs, which is getting bigger, better in the trenches, you know, if their best player available, maybe the best player available is a corner. Maybe it's a linebacker. Maybe it's a safety. Maybe it's a wide receiver. The positions that I think a lot of people look at as not necessarily priorities at this point in time. Uh, so, We'll just sort of have to see it again. It's it's fascinating to me, but sort of that's my semi-educated guess on, on what the Falcons will probably do next offseason. But a lot of that will be determined by how you know guys play the rest of the season. So we'll just sort of have to see. And if you want to send in questions to be answered on future Q and A's, of course, guys, you can do so by hitting me up on Twitter at Lockdown Falcons on Facebook at Lockdown Falcons, or you can send an email to Lockdown Falcons at mail.com, or you can leave a comment here on the Lockdown Falcons YouTube. Uh, page and before we duck out of here guys you know make sure you check out the peacock and williamson podcast as your second listen you know as we thank you every day for making locked on falcons your first listen always have recommendations for your second listen peacock and williamson's one locked on braves locked on hawks locked on bulldogs uh all of these shows are free and available on the locked on podcast network and you can find them on apple odyssey google and spotify and, and locked on braves and locked on bulldogs are currently on youtube as well so there you guys have it appreciate you for tuning in for another episode of lockdown falcons tomorrow's episode will be a uh crossover thursday in which we will be looking at this upcoming week 10 matchup between the falcons and cowboys with the boys over there at the lockdown cowboys podcast marcus mosher and uh, landon mccool and it you know, you guys know, many of you Falcon fans know, Marcus is infamous for being the guy that constantly talks about the Falcons making a mistake, passing on CeeDee Lamb to take AJ Terrell. So I'm sure we will have a conversation about that on tomorrow's episode. So appreciate it, guys. Until then.